To start off for our first interview, I would like to welcome Dr. Juliana Ramsey from the Department of Chemical Engineering. Welcome, Dr. Ramsey. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about your journey to becoming a professor here at Queen's um, and how you became interested in research relating to pollution and bioremediation. Well, that's a very complicated story to tell because uh, unlike some people, I didn't plan to become a professor at Queen's. <laughs> so this kind of evolved and I guess if you're taking bioremediation as the starting point, it would go back to my undergraduate degree, which was in microbiology. Okay. And there, uh, as a guest professor in one of the courses, was somebody from chemical engineering who was interested in biosurfactant production. And this was with a view to enhancing bitumen removal from tar sands. Okay. And so I, I liked the application aspect, so I ended up doing my fourth year thesis in his group and also my master's. And so in my master's, I was looking at uh, biosurfactant production. And then you went on to the PhD. And, and back then, there was no idea of using this sort of thing for bioremediation. Uh, but it can all be applied to bioremediation. But in my PhD work, I looked at uh, biopolymer production to plug up little pore spaces in the subsurface when they're doing enhanced oil recovery because it then happens that they do things like polymer flooding and uh, water flooding and there's a mismatch in viscosity between the flow of the water and the flow of the oil so that the water is less viscous so it bypasses the oil right. and so it doesn't do a very good pushing job anymore to the well. So I ended up looking at technology to prevent that, it, to remediate, I guess, the problem of the water bypassing the oil. And while I was doing my PhD, started to go to conferences. The one that I can remember most well is the one that was in Shangri-La, where there were a bunch of people doing hydrocarbon degradation, surfactant production, and these are people who, I guess, serve as a foundation for things that eventually became bioremediation. As of so far, what would you consider to be the most exciting find in your research career? I should tell you that it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with bioremediation, the most exciting, because remember my first degree is in microbiology, yes. so my focus is on using microorganisms, and I use them in two ways. One is to treat pollutants in the environment, so that's right. the bioremediation part. And the other is to use them to produce a product of value. And the product of value that we've focused on over a large number of years is an intracellular polymer that microorganisms make. Thermoplastic would be like the water bottles you drink from. Thermoelastomers are like um, uh, a rubber that you can stretch and stretch and stretch and take forever to break. Okay. And so what we've done is mobile reactor work and uh, process development with that to actually have a process that we think could be scalable at the industrial uh, level for producing the organism that accumulates this polymer and for separating it from the cell so that you can end up with something that's saleable. I guess the reason is that we've seen it come the furthest. There are lots of other things that we do where, you know, the, the, the discovery is smaller, but this one is a, has a more complete. So right now one of your current projects looks at the bioremediation of polyaromatic hydrocarbons, um, specifically looking at um, iron-3 reducing microorganisms. Can you tell a bit more about this project and your findings related to these microorganisms? Well, first of all, the reason why we're interested in that has to do with when they insist that you remediate a site that's contaminated, say, with petroleum hydrocarbons, they wanted you to go in and actively clean up the site. Right. Uh, but they have since realized that organisms naturally occurring in the environment could actually do this cleanup. It just takes a whole lot longer. This company, Nova Husky, uh, they're, they're, they're into oil production. They were interested in looking at what we call natural attenuation um, of hydro petroleum hydrocarbons in the environment, but the regulatory agencies just don't want you to 
say it's being remediated, they want to understand the mechanism by which this right. is occurring. So we looked at the anaerobic degradation of these contaminants, petroleum hydrocarbon type contaminants. And the reason why we focus on anaerobic degradation is because once these compounds are in the environment, they represent a large amount of carbon. So whatever amount of oxygen is there is usually used up fairly quickly. Okay. So you end up with an anaerobic environment, which means that you're using an electron acceptor other than oxygen. So you're looking at things like nitrate, sulfate, iron-3. The reason why we're interested in iron-3 is because of all those electron acceptors, it's the most abundant okay. in, 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 in the Earth. So the issues with that as well is that a lot of times it occurs in a form that's poorly bioavailable. So the microorganisms can't use it very well. And the amount of energy it gains from some of the forms that naturally occur is low. So the rate of degradation is low. But there might be ways that you could make it more accessible. There might be other forms of iron because, uh, that would enhance the rate. And so that's one of the things that we looked at. And we actually saw that um, you could enhance the rate of degradation so that it's perhaps somewhat more similar to aerobic degradation uh, if it was solubilized and we use things like humic acids which is naturally occurring in the soil okay. uh, like compost has got a lot of humic acids in it, humic materials. So we were trying to understand the mechanism and so that's why we were doing that work. So what are some of the mechanisms, I guess, that you've looked at microorganisms use for degrading hydrocarbons? I should give you a little bit of a step back a little yeah. bit, because we talked about when, say, petroleum hydrocarbons as an example of a contaminant in the environment. So the mechanisms are going to be different depending on the chemical that you're trying to right. remediate. But if you use petroleum hydrocarbons as the example, as I said, they represent an abundant carbon source. Yep. And what you find most often limiting the rate of degradation other than the terminal electron acceptor is available nutrients. Okay. Like there might not be enough of a nitrogen source and a phosphorus source to allow the degradation of that carbon amount of carbon in a, a decent rate. So that's one of the things that people always try to address and there are ways you can theoretically calculate that out. Uh, but the problem is even though if you know how much total nitrogen and phosphorus that it takes, you can't just add it. Right. Because when you do that, you find that that amount that you've just added is inhibitory. So then you have to sort of think of strategies in terms of a repeated addition or a slow release agent or something like this. So there's that in terms of when you talk about mechanisms of degradation. It's not really a mechanism, but it's an important concept as a first yeah. step. The next aspect is the bioavailability of the carbon substrate. Because depending on the component of the petroleum hydrocarbons, some are more water soluble than others. And the general premise is that organisms, because they live in the water phase, or, or, or they prefer water to a hydrocarbon, they will utilize the components that are more water soluble than the water insoluble one. However, we know that some microorganisms produce biosurfactants naturally. Mm -hmm. And what the biosurfactants do when you reach a certain concentration is they can either emulsify or they create micelles. And this is like where all the hydrophilic portions are sticking out in the water phase and the hydrophobic portions are facing each other, say within a circle. And what you find is hydrophobic molecules tend to gravitate towards each other because you're looking at like dissolving in like, right? So your hydrocarbons end up in the center of what we call the micelle, yeah. and so what essentially happens when you reach that uh, concentration where you can form these micelles is you have now increased the surface area of the available petroleum hydrocarbons okay. because there now is droplets either as 
in my cells, so if they're emulsified, the, the, the idea if they're emulsified is the same anyways. And then the, 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 the idea is how does that hydrocarbon get from inside the micelle to inside the cell? And that's always been an uh -huh. interesting challenge because you're looking at the surfactant molecule now as if it's a lipid, right? Yeah. And if you look at the outside of a cell, it's a lipid bilayer, right? Yeah. So the different theories that people have, I don't know that we really understand how it gets from the micelle to the inside. What some people say is that when the two sets of lipid-like molecules come together, uh, that somehow the hydrocarbon gets into the cell. Uh, but we also know that some cells have transport molecules in the membrane. So right. there must be some active transport involved rather than some kind of passive mechanism. Okay. But there have not been a lot of studies that demonstrate that. But and so once it gets inside the cell, if it's got the competency, if it's got the enzymes, uh, then degradation should happen, right? Okay, but to sum it up, I guess, bioavailability, bioavailability would be key. That's and right. And then um, the presence of an optimal amount of nutrients, such as nitrogen or That's right, that's okay. right. Yeah, th th those are two important things, yeah. Okay, so you've also looked significantly into bioreactors um, in your research. Um, could you give us I guess, an explanation to what bioreactors are um, and um, more of how they work. Uh, you can consider a bioreactor as uh, a reactor where you can have a fair amount of control. First of all, it depends on what you want to do with it. Uh, if you want to grow a pure culture, one single species of organism in there, this is something that you could sterilize and prevent from being contaminated by the organisms that are just surrounding us right now. Okay. Uh, and then you can control all the environmental conditions like pH, uh, temperature, the rate of nutrient addition, and uh, essentially the rate of growth and all of this. Um, and uh, when you can do that, you can manipulate the conditions so that you have optimal product production or optimal growth of the microorganisms if the cells themselves is what you're aiming at. For myself, with some of my bioremediation work, I also look at the subsurface of the earth that's down there as a reactor, except it's open and you have no control. Okay. Uh, but you have to have an understanding of what's there and you have to sort of project what lack of control is, is going to mean to, to your bioremediation process. So would you say um, an open environment with a lack, uh, I guess a lack of control is, would you consider that to be more effective at um, bioremediation than a controlled environment? Or? It depends a lot depends. because uh, if you go to a bioreactor where you have a lot of control, you're looking at a higher cost in terms of just operating that and mm -hmm. having the reactor and stuff like this. For some uh, remediation, bioremediation processes, that is a cost that's not practical. Um, so that, for instance, when people talk about treating uh, groundwater right. in the subsurface, the trend today now is treat it right where you find it and you treat that area as if it were a bioreactor. So that you can control or limit where the water flows because what they'll do is at the downstream end they can put some uh, recovery wells that would prevent the contaminants so that kind quality of water from going further downstream and you can limit that area if you want. Um, the QGEM project this year involves recruiting this natural hydrocarbon degrading bacterium called Marinobacter um, for degrading oil spills out in a AC environment. Um, do you think it would be feasible to use um, this sort of bacterium and maybe in like a bioreactor, upscale it for like cleaning up oil spills in the ocean? The short answer is yes, but there are a few other things that you have to consider. Usually what people talk about and is that if you're talking about say like petroleum hydrocarbon or a lot of contaminants that have mixtures of compounds because in petroleum hydrocarbon You've got linear hydrocarbons, branches, cyclic compounds, aromatic, polyaromatic compounds. And 
when you ask one microorganism to be able to degrade all those different structures efficiently, um, you have to be careful because usually people talk about a consortium is good. Mm -hmm. um, but the nice thing that I, I did a little bit of looking up about this Merinobacter, and it seems to do alkanes, it seems to do cyclic compounds, it seems to do uh, aromatic compounds, but to varying uh, goodness, if you wish. Yeah. Um, so you might even consider um, looking a little bit at the range of structures that these compounds uh, that could be degraded by, by this organism. So, so that's one thing. And this organism, uh, you, you want to focus on marine uh, petroleum in the marine environment? Yes. Okay, so this is nice because this organism is, uh, I'm not sure if it's, uh, it's halo tolerant or if it's halophilic, but I, I, I think I saw it will grow in up to 6% sodium yes. chloride, which is fine for, yeah. for your purposes. Um, the, the issue with growing a halophile is the kind of reactor that you would have to use because salt tends to corrode things. So if you have a lot of uh, components in your reactor that's metal or stainless steel, they will corrode with okay. time. And, 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 and we learned this from a group that is out in Brest in uh, France and they work with halophilic organisms. They actually have one of these submersible submarines that go to the bottom of the ocean and recover extreme halophiles in extreme environments. Okay. And so they shared with us some of their experience <laughs> and essentially say how, well, how poorly they do in the sense that it destroys a lot of their reactors. But mm. they've, they've, they've done it. But okay. I think what you can do is, if you tend to go in this environment, you just have to think about your reactor design so that you avoid a lot of these metal components, right? right yeah. uh, things that are not going to stand up to halophilic conditions, to, to the salt. Um, so those are the two things that I think. Usually though, in a lot of situations like that, people might want to do what they call uh, just um, by augmentation. What that means is that in your lab, you just grow up large quantities of this organism, you create a formulation where the active microorganism is in combination with your nutrients that you can then add to the marine environment where you have your oil spill. And so what you're doing is you're increasing the population there with a specific hydrocarbon degraded that you think might be better than even the ones there. So you don't eliminate the naturally occurring organisms that might contribute to it. You're enhancing okay. the possibility of getting better results. Where do you see the future of bioremediation and how big of an impact in the society do you think it will have in the next, say, 10 to 15 years? Uh, I think it depends where you are in the world. <laughs> uh, if, if you look at the statistics in terms of remediation and where remediation technologies are used, and, and bioremediation is a subset of that. Uh, it's actually a small subset of that. Uh, a lot of remediation uh, happens in North America, uh, particularly the US and Canada, some in Europe, so if you're looking, and this is what they do in the U.S., they're looking for markets in which to expand. Mm -hmm. You'd be looking at places like uh, China, India, uh, the Middle East, uh, where you, uh, South America, where you have uh, uh, contamination that needs to be addressed. And in those countries, they're getting around to it, just a bit more slowly than you might like. But the thing is, you know, in, in those countries, they have other priorities as well, right? There, right. There's a lot of poverty and stuff like this. But uh, they have been investing in environmental cleanup. It's become more, people are more aware of it in those countries. Um, it's a growth area. but. It, it's not going to grow by leaps and bounds. It has a lot to do with 
political climate as well, because although you would consider the U.S. to have been the leader in environmental things, recently with Trump coming into government, he's cut back on what the U.S. EPA has for funding, and so we don't know where that's going to lead to. He's withdrawn the U.S. from the Paris Accord, so, mm -hmm. you know, it's added, added an unpredictable factor in being able to answer your question. Normally I would say there is growth potential, but a lot of this is also being led by, by the U.S. But Okay. Was being led by the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess kind of to build off that question, um, do you think in today's society we're doing enough to counteract pollution um, in terms of research um, as well as um, working with industry partners on kind of combating, say, um, oil spills or um, like um, any kind of pollution or global warming? Well, global warming is a good one because I've recently got interested in uh, this project because um, uh, out west with the uh, tailing ponds, the production of greenhouse gas emissions is a question that they want to address in these tailing ponds. So that got me reading and looking at stuff. And I think bioremediation could address this area as well. It's just that we don't know a whole lot about, uh, because in an agricultural context, we do have a lot of methane and N2 production being produced. Uh, and what we need is a better understanding of how perhaps we need to manipulate those environments to either one, reduce that, or two, convert those products into something that's more, uh, less problematic in terms of being greenhouse gases. And I will learn more about this in the next few years because uh, our project is being funded and we have to learn. What kind of advice would you give to, say, a science or engineering student that wants to pursue a career path that um, models after what you do, so looking at maybe bioremediation or pollution treatment? Um, uh, multidisciplinary background is key. Okay. Um, uh, some of the things that you guys are doing in the life sciences, like my first degree is in microbiology. Yeah. And I made the transition into chemical engineering uh, through my fourth year thesis project. And uh, when I teach bioremediation today, I teach it to people in environmental studies, chemical engineering, civil engineering, um, sometimes even people with a chemistry background. And the, the one thing that I know must mean that I'm getting some kind of balance in there is like, for instance, the chemical engineers would complain there's too much civil engineering in it, the, this group will complain there's too much of that because it, it takes a, an understanding of the interaction between the compounds and the soil uh, and knowledge of the microorganisms as well um, and an understanding of the biodegradation which is essentially biochemistry and organic chemistry you know because they all come together so that what it means is you don't uh, have a closed mind when you go into this you have to be able to take up soil science along with engineering components as well as biochemistry, microbiology, and so on. All right, thank you so much. My pleasure.